Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Natasha Mwala. I am a MICE 2 student at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, and I will be your moderator today. So our session is titled, Is There a Human Right to Food? And with us, we have two very capable speakers. So first we have Professor Amy Bentley, who is a professor of food studies at NYU, New York University. She's also a historian and an editor. We also have Mr. Roberto Beruti, who worked as a regional expert at the permanent representation of Italy to the EU before joining the cabinet of the EU Commissioner of Agriculture, Janusz Wojciechowski. So before we proceed, a few housekeeping rules. We will first give the floor to the speakers who are going to make the presentation. We should be approximately seven minutes because we have some time constraints. And then we are going to open the floor to questions. So the questions can be addressed in three ways. First, you can send them directly to the questions account. If you look in the, um, the tile number section, you're going to the questions account and you can send it directly there. Second, you can put it in the chat directly and I'll be able to read it. And third, you can also unmute yourself and you'll be able to pose a question. So without further ado, we are going to start with Professor Bentley and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. And thank you to all the conference organizers for inviting me to participate and speak on this important topic. I am delighted to be here. To briefly answer the question, is there a human right to food? The answer is a resounding yes. Article 25 of the 1948 United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has a right to the standard of living adequate for the health and well being of himself and his family, including food. But the world governing bodies have gone beyond this to articulate the right in more detail. And in 1988, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, defined this right further. It said, the right to freedom from hunger is fundamental, which means that the state has an obligation to ensure, as a minimum, that people do not starve. In addition, the statement noted that states should also take all of the necessary steps possible toward the goal of full enjoyment of the right to adequate food, and that that adequate food must also be culturally acceptable, and it must be environmentally and socially sustainable. We should also add, <clears throat> excuse me, that complementing the right to food is the universal human right to water specifically sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically accessible and affordable water. And the right to adequate sanitation is also closely linked. These goals of course are aspirational. It is a big complicated world with numerous seemingly insurmountable problems, but this should not stop us from striving to achieve these goals. While it is urgent to plan carefully to maintain and improve the global food supply, there is technically today sufficient food to feed people, but that food is not distributed equitably. A great deal of it is wasted and more of it needs to be produced and consumed locally and with an eye toward climate change. Today, we are also facing the huge challenge of a food supply often too uh, dominated by ultra processed, minimally nutritious food that is also harming human health. But as articulated in the United Nations declarations, people are the rights holders and states are the duty bearers of providing food and sanitation services and adequate food. Rights holders can claim their rights and duty bearers must guarantee the rights without discrimination. Universal access to food and water, we know are terribly wicked problems, wicked in the sense that they are seemingly unsolvable, but nevertheless must be addressed and attempted because they are so vast and important. As long as we're being aspirational, I would argue that not only are people entitled to a sufficient quantity of nutritious food, but that food should be tasty and delicious, culturally appropriate, and able to provide pleasure. Emphasizing deliciousness as a human right may seem frivolous and a luxury when so many people strive to just get enough of the basics to survive. 
But I want to argue that that is the exact opposite. And briefly, I'll state four reasons in the rest of my time. First, deliciousness, which is taking pleasure in food, is central to culture. Col food is central to culture. Research shows the power of commensal dining, gathering together with family or community, is a central part of cultural cohesion. Second, deliciousness is democratic. All people should have a right to delicious food, regardless of financial status. To say that poorer people or refugees don't have the right to culturally appropriate delicious food is to say that only people of a higher socioeconomic status or with more stability deserve it. Third, delicious food provides pleasure and pleasure is crucial to human well-being. Humans are hardwired to seek out, appreciate, and gain benefit from aesthetic sensorial pleasure. It is part of human existence. We deem it acceptable in other arenas such as nature, art, and music, and why not food as well? Thus, we can make an aesthetic and sensual case for deliciousness as part of the human pursuit of beauty and pleasure. The aesthetic and sensual mobilizes the senses. We are dependent on all of our senses, even the so-called lower senses of smell, touch, and taste that are so central to food. Texture, aroma, taste are all information that help us understand and encounter the world around us. They help us think in new ways. They make us pause to reflect and evaluate. And finally, delicious food is healthier food. Nutrition studies show that sick people respond better to delicious food. They eat more and recover faster. Hospitals, prisons, and schools are beginning to understand the link between delicious food and mental and physical health. And I might add that some countries do this much better than my own of the United States. I realize there is a hierarchy of needs and that often victims of famine or displaced refugees, first and foremost, need sustenance to survive. And therefore the emphasis is on sufficient calories and nutrients and is appropriate. But I encourage all of us to include notions of culturally appropriate, delicious food as also part of our aspirational goal of imagining food and water as basic fundamental human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bentley, for the very insightful presentation, especially when you are uh, when you emphasized on the cultural aspect of food. It was really insightful. So next, I will give the floor to Mr. Berukti. Thanks, Natasha. And uh, let me uh, say something a little bit out of the scope. I just want to thank you for the invitation and to uh make my compliments for what you are doing as a diplomatic academy students initiative uh because uh, uh like these days are showing and proving to us we need more good and high level diplomacy uh just to try to uh solve crisis uh, and i think uh, your efforts and your course of study is uh, the best way to improve skills uh, and to go in this direction. I just wanted to make this brief derogation on the scope. Like uh, Professor Bentley already said, uh, the answer is yes, the right to feed oneself in dignity and to be free from uh, hunger is guaranteed by the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights. Uh, and uh, over 170 uh, state parties have undersigned this uh, covenant. Uh, as such, the right to food is a legal obligation anchored in international law. In order to fulfill this obligation, many countries and international organizations have introduced concrete actions to influence policies and laws for the realization of the right to food. The most uh, recent uh, among these is the zero hunger commitment uh, ensuring in the sustainable development goals of the UN agenda 2030. And now uh, we are coming 
into what the European Union is doing. The European Union and its member states are at the front, forefront of fighting hunger and malnutrition, ensuring that all Europeans have adequate access to food is the art of the EU common agriculture policy. The CAP was one of the earliest uh, EU policies created in order to avoid future winters of famine that Europe went through after the Second World War. Naturally, the primary mission of the CAP remains to feed all Europeans in a matter that is both healthy, sustainable, and resilient, like uh, Professor Bentley uh, reminded us uh, before, to systemic shocks. But in today's globalized age, the purpose of the CAP is not only to feed the peoples of Europe, but also to contribute to food security around the world. And we do so in uh, a no small manner. This is done in mainly two ways by developing best practices in the EU and sharing them to empower our international partners and by entering the mutually beneficial trading relations around food. It is a mark of the resilience and sustainability of our internationally oriented food system that despite the pandemic, the EU's agri-food export continue to grow to over 100 84 billion euros per annum. The EU's food exports does make an enormous contribution to making food available and affordable price. The EU offers particularly advantages trading condition to so-called least developed countries, including the concession to LDCs that they may temporarily close their market to imports in order to protect strategic sectors without any reciprocation from the EU. Beyond trade, however, the EU and its member states also continue to be the world's largest humanitarian aid donor, uh, including 500 million euro per annum food assistance, which is the 20% of the EU total humanitarian aid budget. The EU also leading the way, by example, when it comes to reforming the agri-food sector for the 21st century. And the recent uh, approval of our common agriculture policy is a, a sort of proof of that. The EU use every opportunity at the multilateral fora from G7, G20, and the OECD and FAO's ministerial conferences and special gatherings such as the UN Food System Summit in 2021 to hasten the transformation of the global agri-food system towards resilience, diversification, and sustainability. The EU champions a wide variety of regional and international initiatives, including the implementation of the FIO's voluntary guidelines on the right to food and efforts to reach sustainable development goal number two, zero hunger. We believe that the mission of agriculture is twofold, feed the people of today and uh, extremely important, ensure food security for future generations. For that, we need the, to redouble our efforts so that we don't sacrifice the long-term sustainability of the ecological systems upon which agriculture and aquaculture depends on the altar of the short-term productivity gains. The EU ambition Green Deal and the specific farm to farm strategy aim to strike a balance between these two needs, food security today and sustainability for the future. I like to remember, to remind you always that uh, in the French language, there is a, a translation of sustainability, which is very uh, precise, durability, uh, to be more able to last for longer. Among these objectives, farm to forest strategy notably strive to reduce the ecological footprint of agriculture by aiming for 25% of farmland to be organically managed. And in this case, Austria is the champion out of the 27 member states of Europe because Austria already reached and uh, overcome the 25% of uh, land 
cultivated in an organic manner. Fertilizer, pesticides used to be uh, reduced by 50% and agroecological practices to be strengthened to protect biodiversity and soil nutrition content. Of course, our efforts do not take place in a vacuum. In the interest of improving globally accepted international standards, the EU defends the rules-based multilateral trading system in the World Trade Organization and all related fora. The EU is committed to mainstreaming sustainability into bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, including a new push for biodiversity and deforestation-free supply chains. Uh, let me finish in saying that future policy action will also aim to improve the due diligence and transparency of supply chains for products associated with desertification and land erosion, particularly resource intensive cash crops that do not contribute to food security. Proactively diversify trade abroad and sustainable climate smart food protection at home helps the EU achieve the strategic autonomy, which is extremely important. It needs to ensure that its citizens will always have guaranteed food security, even in times, and unfortunately, we are living this kind of times of pandemic and international armed conflict. Thanks a lot for the attention and uh, again, uh, my compliments for your initiative. Thank you so much, Mr. Roberti, Mr. Roberto, sorry, for that insightful presentation. So now the floor is open to questions and I will begin with Isabel Knie. Yes, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you to both of you for your very insightful presentations. And I think this question might go more to Professor Bentley, um, because as you mentioned, um, or as you said, uh, that a human right should be guaranteed to everyone and um, can also be claimed by individuals. This uh, considerations actually imply that um, there is also the responsible state uh, is a functioning one. So my question, especially in light of uh, certain countries like Syria, for example, um, what would you do or where do the people go if uh, you have uh, the case of a failing or, or fragile state? Who would be then the responsible one? Wow, Thank that's you. a really that's a really good question. <laughs> um, you know, if we talk about food insecurity and the, and the lack of food as today as a crisis of entitlements, um, borrowing a term from the economist Amartya Sen, who uh, understood that today we produce sufficient calories in the world, but they are not distributed equitably in part because of despotic governments or um, greed, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, distribution problems that are political, economic, cultural. Um, you know, if a state is not functioning and is not uh, fulfilling its obligations, then I think it's larger bodies. I think it's the United Nations. I think it's neighboring states and nations um, I, for two reasons. I think there's a just a basic human rights, uh, fundamental dignity of human beings, right? Uh, uh, reasoning that we are all humans. We all need food to survive. Uh, we are not, uh, expressing our full sense of humanity if we let other people go hungry. And then there's also a pragmatic reason. Uh, countries that, uh, whose people are hungry and starving are unstable countries. And as we know with Syria and other countries that instability can, can spill over and create uh, regional and even global instability. Uh, just one more fact regard, regarding this is inflation is, is, is also, also creating problems globally. Food prices are the highest they've been since 2011. Um, and 2011 was the start of the Arab Spring, which started in part out of unrest over high food prices. So these are very serious issues and um, hugely complicated. And, um, but as I said, nevertheless, we need to, to keep working on them and make sure that um, people have access to food. Thank you very much for your answer. 
Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Roberta Betsy. If you could please unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello. Um, um, grazie, Signor Berutti. Thank you so much, Professor Bentley. Uh, I guess my question is very related to what um, has been asked by Isabel uh, a few seconds ago. Um, um, so if um, guaranteeing a human right um, to food is a national competence, uh, and there are already some states uh, or nations struggling with this, how would you think is it possible to implement this cultural side of it, like this tasty deliciousness? Because I actually never thought of it, uh, of this aspect of the food being, having to be delicious and tasty. So that's what really interests me. What is, in your opinion, the best way to like implement it somehow, especially for nations who cannot even maybe guarantee the minimum amount of food? Sure. Uh, I'm happy to address this, but I think Roberto, as an Italian, is perfectly adequate to also address this, <laughs> if you'd like to say something, Roberto. I'm just saying that uh, uh, I think we have to start from the culture and from the education. We have to transmit uh, the, the good uh, pleasure that we can have, like uh, you, Amy, uh, were saying before, uh, to put together not just the need to be fitted, but also the pleasure to gather around, to uh, spend some social time together. And I think in this way, every single village, and you, Roberta, knows, uh, like me, that in Italy, this biodiversity in terms of uh, cultural food is so uh, diffused but so different one to each other. And uh, there are uh, maybe small towns uh, far uh, one to the other, two, three kilometers that have different, completely different uh, culture and uh, characteristics in terms of uh, sociality, in terms of uh, language, uh, the dialects, in terms of food. And this is part of the culture. So for this, uh, I guess, uh, we have a little bit to leave to the uh, implementing of the single culture, but to uh, ensure the minimum level of dignity in terms of quality and quantity. After that, I wouldn't be so um, invadent in terms of uh, uh, pushing this kind of tasty instead of another, because the cultures are so different and in the same time uh, they they are the real soul of the local communities yeah. i i agree with that and i'll also just say um i got interested in this aspect of the topic because in my own country the united states um sometimes um talking about taste talking about deliciousness is seen as elitist uh and seen as undemocratic and too fancy for, uh, for the regular people. Uh, and I thought about that and I thought, well, that's not right. You know, that everyone is entitled to uh, delicious and, and that is defined by their cultures, by their habits, their food habits. Um, that's not a right that's just relegated for the rich. That's a right that should be available to everybody. And so how do we implement that uh, in the face of huge hunger, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that it needs to be a part of the conversation and um, uh, not to be relegated to a certain elite status. If I may add just one information for you all, uh, as a European Union, we are um, trying to, uh, to push a lot uh, uh, the concept of balanced healthy diet. No matter what the kind of diet or the components of this diet uh, are, but the principle that uh, we have to educate consumers to uh, privilege more the balanced healthy diet uh, instead of the food, no matter which uh, kind of or where, which from, where from, and in the same time, just to be able to have a healthy approach 
to the to the diet. And together with the healthy approach, I'm sure that also the tasty and the deliciousness of uh, those will come uh, together. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. And now I will hand over the floor to Mikhail Dushanek. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Also from my side for your inputs and also for your nice words about the conference and our studies. I think it's very nice to hear this support. <laughs> and my question will actually regard the common agricultural policy and its effect on developing countries. Uh, so I think it's best directed to you, Mr. Beruti, as a member of the European Commission. Um, I've re recently read an article that states that despite the rather recent reform in the CAP, the agricultural subsidies given out by the EU still give European food exporters a huge advantage uh, in the food markets of especially developing countries, where the producers simply cannot compete with those prices and those countries are therefore unable to develop an agricultural market that can feed its people simply on its own. Um, and the European Union, of course, does send a lot of development aid in countries of need. Um, but wouldn't it make more sense to change the CAP in that regard in order to allow those markets to develop, which would make them less reliant on imports in the middle to long run? Um, I mean, you already stated one way by teaching, for instance, best practices to, to local farmers also. Um, but what is your opinion? Are there more ways to, to help them? And what's your opinion on this matter overall? You know, it, this last uh, CAP is the most uh, revolutionary CAP made since the very beginning of this uh, important uh, tool. It's uh, 60 years, then uh, we are, uh, we are uh, developing this support, as I told you, starting from the need to feed everyone coming out from the Second World War. We are trying to shape the CAP, um, as I mentioned before, uh, in, a, in a dual modality to uh, allow the farmers to remain in the market as much as they can, but together to guarantee quality and quantity uh, in the respect of the of the biodiversity of the nature and the, the ecosystems and that's why we introduced this concept of ecosystems that uh, trying to give a little bit more grants to the one that will be able to cope those two uh, fundamental elements uh, we try to maintain the same level of contributions. Of course, you are right. We can be uh, somehow armed by the imports of uh, food with less uh, quality and consequently with a price more affordable for the majority of the citizens. And that's why I was mentioned before that we have to try to educate citizens and we are trying to do this with a promotion policy that every single year we, uh, we are issuing and we are trying to implement as much as we can just to be able to try to address uh, the citizens to consume maybe less but a much high quality uh, food. Uh, I I give you an example. I don't know if you follow the recent uh, um, collecting of uh, signature uh, to ask the end of cage age uh, that reached something like 1,200,000 uh, 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 signatures and impose somehow the European Union to change and to pass from the enriched cages uh, to breed uh, hens or rabbits uh, or some other animals to a free range uh, uh, way to uh, breed and to manage the livestock. And this could uh, quite for sure uh, bring uh, the price of, for instance, of the eggs uh, to raise a lot. And we have to be mm, conscious and to be careful not to have an invasion of 
cheaper food from outside without uh, the same uh, sanitary and phytosanitary specification. So we, but at the same time, we have to educate the consumers to switch to another way to also to go and to make shopping uh, for uh, food uh, stuff. I thank you very much for your answer. I mean, I understand it's a very, very difficult topic and I like just my side, I'm very happy that the European Union cares about food standards because I trust them. <laughs> and yeah, so it's yeah, of course difficult to balance those interests. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So now I will be reading a question from the chat. So any of you is welcome to answer. What would you define food sovereignty as? And what role do governments and international organizations play in ensuring food sovereignty? Ladies first. <laughs> okay. Uh, food sovereignty is a really important emerging concept. Uh, uh, groups, particularly indigenous peoples or peoples who have been on lands for a long time demanding access and control to their own food production uh, without or with only invited interference from transnational corporations, other governments, um, other private individuals. Uh, it, it's encouraging to see the movement growing and becoming stronger uh, because it's, I think, necessary um, as we search to uh, maintain and improve the food supply uh, moving into this, this next century. Um, land is, arable land is getting more and more scarce and there are more companies and, uh, and countries that are vying for that. So that, that people be allowed to assert their rights over their traditional um, lands, I think is, is super important. Roberto. Yes, and uh, following what I mean said, uh, I think the pathway that we started uh, with the, the Food System Summit and the Pre-Food System Summit that we had in Rome and then uh, to the uh, Annual Assembly of the United Nations, trying to outline what could be the concrete uh, actions to support uh, the capacity to a self-autonomy for the countries that are not able up to now to, to address this need, this local need is uh, the first step toward uh, some concrete uh, actions and some uh, useful uh, contribution coming, of course, like Amy said, from the, the most developed countries. And uh, on the contrary, the most developed countries are uh, seeing in a, in a very uh, recent future, a lack of arable lands. So we have to uh, try to consider the entire world as a unique and try to compensate the lacks of uh, each of us. Uh, and not trying to teach anyone uh, something, but trying to cope in a in a more uh, in the most uh, uh, cooperative way uh, altogether, just to compensate. And of course, research and innovation, the new uh, breathing techniques, and all other uh, important tools, like uh, for instance, uh, EU as a uh, came out with Horizon Europe, something like 100 billion uh, uh, euros to devote to research and innovation is one of uh, one out of many as a further tools to 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 go in that direction. I agree and and I agree that that uh, the right to food sovereignty, and the use of say appropriate technology are not incompatible. That if groups, groups can and should seek out the newest technology that they would like, as long as they're not, they don't become beholden and in debt to 
uh, you know, countries or the World Bank or um, corporations. So technology and appropriate technology can be a, a real help in um, improving their lands, improving their yields. I feel like, um, I know this is talked a lot about in a lot of areas, but I feel like it's not emphasized enough that when we talk about, when we have these conversations, I think always part of them should be um, a goal of eliminating food waste of food that's, that's currently produced. Uh, I think upwards of 40% of all food produced is wasted, whether it's production, uh, processing, or the consumer stage. I mean, just if you think about that, 40% of food currently being produced goes to waste. Now we could never get to zero um, be, for a variety of reasons, but we could cut that. I, I would think if we worked concertedly to cut that in half, um, think of all that, that food that is existing in the food system be used to help people have um, a better food supply. And I just, I, I keep, I want to just insert that in every conversation I have. <laughs> Fully agree with you. And uh, uh, if I may add, circular economy has started as a concept from agriculture, in agriculture. And if you notice, uh, some of the recipes, the more uh, old recipes are based on that, not to waste food. Yeah, exactly. I think we've lost that concept and I think we are returning to it and we need to continue returning to that. Uh, thank you so much. I'd also like to remind the audience that you can unmute yourself and ask a question, but I'm gonna read the next question from the chat. Is there an existing link between the right to food and the rest of the existing human rights and what is it? So any of you can also answer the question. If I may say just, two words. Yes, of course, the right to food is the base of any other human rights, because if you don't feed human people, they will not even have the need of some other rights. I agree. I think of Abraham, I think it's Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the base is food. Like we cannot progress to higher levels of safety and security until we have sufficient food. And maybe I'll just also add that, um, you know, we're dealing with aspirations and pragmatics. Uh, the aspiration that, that food is a human right, that everybody deserves adequate, culturally appropriate, safe, nutritious food. And then the pragmatics, the, the huge difficulties of making that happen. Um, we always have to think about both. I, I think we can't ev ever forget the aspirational aspect, but we also need to be aware that we're dealing with really complicated pragmatics in implementing that or even addressing that human right. Thank you for that. And one more question from the chat is, how does the right to food apply to different parts of the world considering not everyone lives in homogenic or uniform conditions, for example, parts of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa? I mean, it's complicated. I think just that question shows that it's complicated, that um, minority groups are uh, can often be discriminated against and um, in a variety of ways, which can also impact their right to food, uh, their right to their culturally appropriate food. I just was talking to a student who's doing a project on um, a fermented rice or soy dish that she her, is part of her culture in northern India and it's got a very pungent aroma and it it's, uh, prejudices people in different parts of India and Delhi against her population and this food has been outlawed in Delhi uh, you know so it's a it's a it's a right to one's food that is being exercised for larger reasons political cultural uh, prejudice prejudicial reasons. So it's very complicated. Uh, fully agree. And I, I, I would say also that uh, uh, we have to consider, uh, and we are close to a crisis, which I would say, I would dare to say almost past, but we are facing another one 
which is uncertain in terms of uh, how long will it last or whatever. But in any case, we have to uh, make clear the concept all over the world that food is a basic need and uh, uh, agriculture is, is called primary sector, not by chance. Uh, and we, we noticed that uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so we have to, to teach uh, as much as we can to become self-sufficient and to short a little bit the food supply chain in order to uh, allow everyone not depending uh, from uh, supplies coming from uh, too far from where they live. And, and we noticed that with the difficulties of transportations and whatever during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we, we, we rediscovered the, the, the value and our word is to be able to be self-sufficient. Uh, there was a, a concept uh, revamped by Mr. Cameron uh, at the beginning of his mandate in UK, that is uh, the, the small community uh, capacity of be self-sufficient. But uh, I, I, I'm a little bit proud of saying that uh, Don Sturzo in the, in the beginning of the last century used to make the same concept, uh, not calling like Cameron big society, but uh, calling it in a different way, but the concept at the base was the same. Uh, the, 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 the community should be, should rely and should be able to rely on its own uh, capacity in terms of food and uh, security. And then all the other things could be uh, settled up or uh, built up later on, but this is the essential. I agree and I, completely. And, I, and I'll also add to that. I mean, we wouldn't want to get, we wouldn't want to eliminate global food systems and global trade, um, especially for items that cannot be grown everywhere. I think of all the people in the global north that would uh, riot and freak out if they couldn't have the coffee, for instance. Um, but communities are safer, regions are safer, states are safer if they can grow more food within their boundaries and people can have control over their food sources. So they're not dependent on the geopolitical whims, whims of food being produced across the oceans. And um, people are safer, people eat better food, communities are more stable if they, and it's more sustainably grown and produced food if food is um, produced at a local level. And this concept is mutable with a lot of other sources. Not by chance, there is a, a gas issue right now and together with wheat or uh, uh, maize or whatever it's always uh, quite linked the instability or the stability it depends from which uh, side you are looking at thank you so much uh, unfortunately due to time constraints that was the last question and I would like to thank the audience for taking their time and listening in. Thank you to our speakers, Mr. Beruti and Professor Bentley for taking your time and giving you wonderful presentations. So before the end of this session, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a 30 minute break approximately, and then we will join for the closing panel, which is also in collaboration with the networking panel with the Club DA. Thank you everyone. And I wish you a wonderful rest of the day.